When Beowulf recounts his adventures for his king, Hyalak, he adds some new details, like Grendel's dragonskin pouch, and omits other details that we might think are important. When his story is over, he presents Hyalak with all of the treasures from Hrothgar, except for Weothiel's torque, which he gives to Higid. Beowulf tells his king, These, King Hyalak, I am happy to present to you as gifts. It is still upon your grace that all favor depends. I have few kinsmen who are close, my king, except for your kind self. We learn here that Hyalak is Beowulf's uncle, but unlike Hrothgar's nephew Hrothulf, Beowulf and Hyalak are concerned for the other's good, line 2171. We also learn that Beowulf had been poorly regarded for a long time, was taken by the Yates for less than he was worth, and their lord too had never esteemed him in the mead hall. Later, Beowulf tells how he was fostered out by my father, left in charge of my people's lord. This was probably the result of Ejthiel's exile from Yetland, mentioned earlier by Hrothgar. If so, it would explain why Beowulf was poorly regarded. His father's dishonor as an exile was passed down to him. But those days are over for Beowulf now. In return for the glory that Beowulf has won for the Yates in Denmark, Hyalak gives Beowulf the best example of a gem-studded sword in the Yate treasury, a clear recognition of Beowulf's superlative skill as a warrior. Beowulf's rise from unpromising youth to warrior of great renown connects him also with Shield Sheafson, the orphan foundling who established a Danish royal dynasty. It also forms yet another similarity to Christ, who was born in obscurity and became king of all nations. At this point in the poem, we should also take a step back from the story to consider the structure. In one of the first lessons about this poem, we discussed the Anglo-Saxon technique of interlace structure. Now that we are two-thirds through the poem, we have, we have experienced how the poet interweaves several of these stories from Anglo-Saxon history and legend in order to enhance the themes and beauty of his poem and its central narrative. The details of these individual stories are interesting, and we've discussed how they amplify what's happening in the narrative of the poem. But it is also important to notice the cumulative effect these interlaced threads have on the overall poem, and especially on its atmosphere. As Tolkien explains it, the poet uses his knowledge of these other stories to give his poem a sense of perspective, of antiquity, with a greater and yet darker antiquity behind. These things are mainly on the outer edges or in the background because they belong there if they are to function in this way. But in the center, we have a heroic figure of enlarged proportions. By using these other stories, the Beowulf poet creates something larger than history, something that approaches the archetypal and the mythic, and ultimately creates a poem that has universal applications for all readers, even 21st century postmodern Americans. But before we can talk about those applications, we first must meet a dragon. <laughs>